Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this part two of uh, Mobile Growth Summit Asia. Um, we just want to thank, uh, first, I would like to thank our uh, awesome speakers for joining this early from Europe. Um, it's like 7 a.m. So thank you very much to wake up for us and uh, to exchange and give us your, uh, your expert opinion. Um, I will let it to Kaspar co-founder of Wolf3D to take over right now, um, since you're gonna be the moderator of, uh, of this panel. Hey, and welcome everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Stefan. Uh, and thank you all for joining this virtual panel about the user acquisition and, and retention. Uh, my name is Casper, and I will be your moderator for this panel this morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, I guess it depends where you're currently located. Uh, we'll try to cover today, you know, different topics from user acquisition to retention, product development, and, and more. But now, before before we begin our discussion, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists, and then I'll let you in on how you're going to be able to join in on this conversation via the audience Q&A tool that we have going on today. So first, I'd like to introduce Deepika Murthy to this panel. Uh, Deepika is the lead uh, project manager for, for pricing uh, at Gojek's marketplace team. Prior to that, she led the uh, product and growth analytics efforts at Rocket and Wiki. She has proactively worked towards bringing an experimentation and data-driven decision-making into user acquisition and retention. She was part of the Reforge growth series program in fall 2018 and Advanced growth strategy in spring 2019. Deepika, welcome, welcome to the panel. Next, Hi. next, I'd like to introduce Ronnie Tan. Hello. Ronnie is the managing director of Kuvi Asia, which he also co-founded. Uh, with over 10 years of experience in the gaming industry, he's one of the veterans in Singapore when it comes to this industry. Um, he's, um, he's worked on projects in various platforms covering console gaming, mobile gaming, PC gaming. So by all means, he has a lot of experience on different platforms. Uh, he's also been part of various panel discussions revolving out gaming industry and also the blockchain space. And as a mentor, Ronnie is always ready to guide his staff in the best approach to address various situations whenever tough hurdles are faced. Also, Ronnie, welcome to the panel. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. And as our final panelist, we have David Remessel. David is currently working in King as head of Candy Crush Friends Saga team in London studio. He is an experienced professional in the gaming industry with more than 10 years of experience working in DHQ, Digital Chocolate, Nokia, and King across product, marketing, and uh, sales and business development. So he has a complete picture of, of the mobile ecosystem, having worked, in, uh, having worked for telco operators, device manufacturers, service providers as well as developers. He's been involved in mobile advertising, mobile marketing, mobile services, mobile content, mobile apps, mobile games, and other projects in the similar space for the last 20 years. So thanks so much David, for the interaction. Welcome everyone. All right. So as I mentioned already before, we, we have some dedicated time for, for Q, uh, audience Q&A. But to make it more efficient, uh, uh, we're using this Q and A app that you can see on the uh, on the on the right. So if you have any audience questions throughout this panel discussion, you can submit your question there, and I will be able to see your questions, and then I'll be waving them in into the conversation as it makes sense. So I can't wait to hear what you would like to ask, uh, what what you'd like me to ask. So. I think we have our introductions behind me, and so let's begin with our conversation. And perhaps we can start by addressing the 
elephant in the room. This conference is virtual. You know, we are here gathering online and we've been in lockdown at our homes for a while already. And due to this, people are spending more time online. They're socializing with their friends online. They're socializing with their family online. What is the impact of COVID-19 on the gaming industry and also on our virtual lives? Are there any interesting trends that you're seeing and how has this affected your user acquisition strategies and retention strategies? Ronnie and Tam, you're both on the you know, large gaming companies, you have a lot of uh, experience in the space and, and uh, you've been in, you've been long time in, uh, you know, you've seen different trends, different ups and downs. What, what's your perspective? Perhaps let's start with you, David. Thanks, Casper. Uh, so if we focus on, on player strengths at the moment, we see as most of the entertainment companies are an increasing engagement. So we see most of our players engaging more with our games, generally speaking. And that means that they are having more sessions and more regularly, including, uh, uh, let's say, across the board, not specifically for a game market. So if I can, of call back on something you mentioned as well regarding any trends I see in the industry daily, I would say that many, many companies are focusing on, on retention and trying to uh, increase uh, that through reactivation campaigns and trying to re-engage with the uh, uh, labs players or labs uh, consumers and that's usually through leveraging some of the new properties they have in their uh, in the in their products or the new developments they have there so um, as a consequence of that uh, we've seen as well uh, some kind of changes in the in the user acquisition flows people focusing more in in product i would say uh, marketing through these acquisition campaigns and also i think that we observe that i presume is common across the board as well it's like less competition particularly from e-commerce retail uh, uh companies advertising less but i'm not sure what about you ronnie what do you think what do you have seen i see well actually what we we see from the data is uh, during late march early april you actually do see a dip in the e-commerce portion so that moment, if you were to ramp up your user acquisition, you find that your uh, CPI actually drops a little. It's so kind of happy, so you go for it. But later, when you reach somewhere May, then everything starts to go up again because everyone find, finds that, hey, all our audience are at home. So online is the way to go. So this is where the CPI starts to pick up. And you have to think of uh, more interesting ways to uh, retain the users that you acquire and also get in the new users. Yeah, so I see the trend is is that at first there was a slight dip, and now it's a big go going up on the online user acquisition portion, and then uh, in terms of um, product and marketing, they are getting closer to each other in ter in terms of how they work together. So my marketing is not really like a one sided like you know I just get the user, but they also need to tie in with uh, certain events or content that is being run on the product to make it efficient. Yeah. So All right. My Deep oh, no. Yeah. Uh, so I noticed that people like uh, interacting online. I think that that's a huge change. So even for industries, which was predominantly passive viewing, right? So when I was part of Wiki um, it, and even say Netflix, uh, so you would mostly just watch it by yourself or it, it, it's your pastime after you get back from work and you want to relax, chill, chill with Netflix, right? But now the Netflix parties and even with Wiki, we, we started doing co-viewing. So all those product initiatives are suddenly uh, getting a lot of interest and there are users who want more of it because they miss the social interactions that come from face-to-face -face interactions which was taken for granted uh, people miss those and and then even even animal crossing is so popular because it's a way of you hanging out with your friends so all gaming uh, all games that also has an element of social interaction online is is seeing a boom so, so that sort of uh, also ties hand in hand with reference. So you would then ask your friends to hang out 
watch something with you or play something with you and hence introduce them to the products that you like or enjoy. So I think referrals is uh, gaining traction as one of the acquisition channels. All right. Yeah, if I would like to add uh, something on top of what uh, the speaker mentioned, um, I think that uh, games are not just a place for you to relax on a wind. As she mentioned, it's a place as well to gather up and to team up with your friends and, and some uh, family members and to have some fun together. So I think that that's one of the main reasons why we see this engagement picking up, because people and um, players in our case wanted to meet together virtually at this, and they were not able to do this in the physical space. So yeah, thanks for calling this out, Deepika. Are you guys doing anything special around, you know, this this recent increase of, you know, people spending more time online? You know, we already talked about, like Tipik mentioned, like people wanting to, you know, spend time with their family members, you know, and having some entertainment while doing that. Let's say, you know, play games or, or you know, watch watch just show show online. Um, are you guys addressing this in some specific ways? Are you leveraging this, the, the current situation in some ways? Hmm. Well, I think for our side is that since we know that people uh, are staying home, so in our games, sometimes we run something uh, just straight to the point. We call it a stay home campaign. So we actually give out more free freebies with the hashtag like stay, stay home and say that, okay, this is more energy packs free of charge for you to uh, play the game more so that you increase your uh, session play time then also uh, at, at the same time uh, we launch our content pack with, pack with some uh, monetization bundles to further uh, boost the monetization so that, so that's what the other half then in terms of uh, the pension wise uh, strong push on the community and also on uh, more free stuff to get people to keep engaging and keep playing. Yeah, in our case, we did something similar. So uh, we partnered with World Health Organization on their Play a Particular campaign, where we were trying to leverage games to you know bridge social distances. And as uh, Ronnie was mentioning, we have also games that are having an energy system, which in our case is based on lives. And during April and May, we gave away one week of energy. So you know. For during a full week, people didn't need to spend anything to actually gather their lives, and they were able to play infinitely within that particular week. And uh, in this particular activity, we saw a lot of traction from our community and people re-engaging with it and playing more and really thanking us for you know bringing this to to their lives as well. Yeah, similar for uh, Wiki, it was um, essentially making some of the premium content available for free. So, so people would have more to watch, um, and and hence it would attract more users to come in, and then, then product or marketing could take over to move them to subscriptions and things like that. And um, and at uh, interestingly, at um, Gojek or other ride sharing companies, this is this is the moment where they need to protect uh, supply because uh, it's it's such a supply rich market demands actually basically uh, it was almost reduced to zero or non existent right with the lockdown so then you need to work on supporting your supply so there were a lot of supply incentives um like minimum uh, minimum revenue guaranteed and uh, also working with them so they can manage their rentals vehicle rentals and things like that i think that becomes key for uh, Go gojek and companies like gojek all right, that's awesome. So, so we already a little bit talked about you know user acquisition and trying to get new users on on board. So, we, we, we traditionally we've seen that you know large publishers and marketers you know they spend millions on you know marketing games in in, in online ads, uh, you know Facebook, Google, billboards, TV commercials. Uh, but now what we're seeing is is more and more. It seems like you know influencers and and early users are are driving the the. the game and you know consumer app discovery in in other social channels like twitter discord reddit and 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 so on is that becoming like a new norm and and what's what what's your what's your experience like do you feel facebook and google are obviously the two big whales or is 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 that market saturated 
Well, I think for my side, um, yes, I do invest quite a lot on the Facebook and Google, uh, partly because of the amount of traffic in these two platforms. So there, it has been a bit of trend that this both giant, uh, both giants are, are getting a lot of traction uh, on their traffic. But I think as time goes, uh, we also need to think of, uh, I would say, new channels to get in new users. Yeah, so we may look it into other different uh, platforms or we may try uh, other third party stores. Yeah, and we think of more ways to engage the users and things like that. So um, in, in terms of uh, what I see moving forward is that uh, Facebook and Google, yes, they'll have a lot of traffic, but we also see our alternatives being spring up over time. Well, I think in our case, as you mentioned, uh, Facebook, Facebook and Google are still the main uh, part of our uh, investments, even though we are covering, you know, other networks and other channels, not specifically on, on digital space. Uh, maybe thinking on, on the actual audience and our players, we are maybe slightly different from, from some of other gaming companies because our players are casual players that tend to be older and not so engaged as gamers. So I think that any of the community driven initiatives you mentioned for us are slightly lighter. I don't mean that they don't exist on us, but uh, they are maybe in a, in a smaller uh, capacity compared to other uh, gaming organizations. And uh, in that context as well, I think uh, influencers and celebrities and some of these uh, potential endorsers for our games have been working relatively nice for us, but it's true that it's been really targeted. And uh, for us, an example, it's quite tough to scale this up to an extent where we can compare these uh, to other user acquisition channels. And uh, as an example, in, in my own game, Candy Crush Friends Saga, we run a really uh, powerful campaign with a music band in Korea called Blackpink which was really uh, really uh, relevant and uh, for us and where the partnership with them worked quite, quite well but i presume that maybe it was an exception because in most of the cases were more targeted and focusing on small smaller geographies as well kind of targeted audiences that were uh, specifically uh, working for us but not maybe in a large scale or mass market yeah i think influencers um it it it's it's very close to brand marketing so and and the impact of influencers are very difficult to measure and it would also take uh, a long time for it to mature so so i so i think influencers are interesting but um i think referrals as a medium i think as one of the mediums that i see has benefited the most from from this situation awesome and they oh, yes. go ahead ronnie oh yeah because i was saying i was uh writing a lot of topic of influencers actually for our game we actually worked with uh, ariana grande and Juki perry before so what we see is that they bring in a fresh group of people that is of a different um taste and the different interests and not like gamers kind of all audience and they come with our product and they engage with, with, with it then we, we see like uh, okay some traction some traction loss but uh, not too bad if, if you want to see like, a different perspective have coming from a new group of user base all right, and I think this is this is like the perfect uh, topic for our first audience Q and A question from Nat uh, Natalia. She asked, which which channel is the most cost efficient for your user acquisition? Well, that's that's a very good question, and I presume it really depends on what you are trying to achieve with that specific campaign. Uh, in most of the cases, we are measuring this through ROI and in-game ROI. So uh, uh, I think that uh, in terms of channels, I presume still, if you look for volume or big volume, still Facebook rules. But uh, if uh, you can have really targeted campaigns using other channels to actually uh, make uh, really impactful campaigns, but the problem is there, the scale, as you possibly imagine. Not sure what about the rest. 
Deepika, would you, or Rani, would you like to add here anything? Yeah, I think for our website is that first, uh, you need to set your goals, right? For example, we go for return of ad spend. And then uh, in terms of the channel, we will choose the one that gives us the most uh, customization to lock down to our audience. Like I think Facebook does give me a, a bit more options to target my audience. But it also comes back to your product also. If your product is more general, it's a more general digital product, like not so niche into like, for my case, it must be a game, it must be role playing, it must be people who like you know, Japanese anime, things like that. If yours is not like that, then you can go a bit broad, broader. Then you, you can go for Google, uh, the Google site where they disperse to the mass pub public and they go from the, the uh, different geos to target the users. Yeah, then you me measure again, what was your return of your ad spend? Yeah, maybe something I can I can call out as well is uh, we are, are running a few uh, small campaigns with TikTok that are working relatively nice. But as mentioned, the problem here is a scale. Interesting. Tipika, uh, would you like to like to add? All right, uh, I guess we can you know, move forward from, 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 from here then. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit about, you know, product and marketing, how product and marketing should actually, you know, work together. Historically, we've seen that, you know, marketing has not been that data driven, uh, you know, marketing is host mostly focused on, on, you know, branding or, or just acquiring new users. But now what we're seeing is marketers are also, you know, you know, working more together with the product teams. They're also, you know, their KPIs are around retention and more and more product teams, you know, are consistently delivering experiences together with marketing team. Uh, maybe question to you guys what are the most common mistakes companies usually do as they transition to you know data driven product marketing uh, you know decision making mentality uh, i can i can start i think the first thing uh, is uh, essentially focusing on training right um, so if you have uh, if you have mostly content marketers or brand marketers and you want to transition them into more data-driven product marketing, focusing on retention and growth, I think investing early in getting them trained is very critical. They can always learn on the job, but I think uh, the, the amount of time it gets takes for them to become effective uh, is not worth the, the returns, essentially like like because you're already you have them in a you have you've onboarded them and they're in the company they're expected to do a certain thing but if you don't equip them with the right right training i think it can hurt so maybe on on our case and uh the the thing i will maybe call out here is like when you're trying to optimize um uh any kind of campaign user acquisition or or uh, reactivation campaigns you need to actually think on how this affects the product. I see in the past, you know, many people trying to optimize the, the acquisition funnel and just ending on the app store and not thinking about how this will affect the product itself and trying to become slightly crazy on creative optimization and propose things that are working quite nice from user acquisition perspective or reactivation, but in the end, they don't translate into, you know, engagement in the actual game. So I would presume that will be more around having a product marketing uh, view on the whole campaign rather than just focusing on the acquisition part on the first part of the funnel. Yeah, I think from my take is uh, between marketing and product, some of the common mistakes is choosing the, the wrong metrics as their goal. So maybe for example, maybe one, one fine day, product and marketing, you decide to say, okay, CPI is the goal. That, that, that's the band benchmark. So what happens is that you end up have tons of users coming in, but they are pretty low 
quality because you go for CPI. And then maybe another day, someone say, let's go for LTV. But when they go for LTV, yes and no. But later, they find that they may have been targeting areas where LTV seems to be high. But actually, it's because the installs are rather small. So this happened to be payers and they pay more. So in terms of deciding what metrics to go for, it relates to your product. You identify that, and you set it as this is what I want to measure through marketing to acquire the type of people that aligns with my product and you move forward yeah i would like okay. to echo that so essentially getting your goals and metrics uh, and for following like a framework to structure your campaigns based on that and evaluating if it's able to meet and and generally taking an experimentation uh view for the whole thing and not expecting fixed uh efforts to lead to like uh, concrete results Mm, okay, yeah. In that context, I will also advise you know uh, the people in the audience just to try to do this testing in a smallest case, trying to you know uh, optimize some of the campaigns leveraging smaller scales and maybe a few channels, and then start ramping up rather than trying to put a full blown campaign with you know things that you have not tested. So I think testing is really critical, and I also see you know major uh, campaigns really uh, being uh, frustrated by the fact of not being tested earlier. Yeah, I think the, the 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 topic about you know metrics and, and having goals aligned is, is very important, and I think this is a, a you know good time to also um, ask Rachel's question from from the audience, and she asked, how much is re-engagement a part of your user uh, user retention strategy? So it depends on the pie, right? Uh, how big are your labs users? And and then uh, and you further need to understand your lapsed users. What is the quality of uh, these users? Like dormant users, are they genuinely um, they've lost interest? Uh, and and usually ROI on re-engagement, re I think it's very important to analyze and get right because when you look at it, you may have a lot of dormant users, but but the number of users you will be able to re-engage is very little, and and the effort that you spend re-engaging them could also cause them to further um, get disillusioned about your product because you're continuously bombarding them or trying to get them back so so there is like a certain time window where you can do it so something like recently dormant i think that's the best window so they've not come back to your game um, so usually they used to be weekly or daily users, but for some reason they've not come back in the last two weeks. So I think that's like a good sweet spot to engage them, then wait for months and then try and engage users who have not come back in say three months, six months, things like that. Yeah, I think that uh, maybe answering directly the question, it's really important. I think it's critical uh, in our case. Uh, re-engagement as part of our, let's say, player management perspective. And this uh, starts as something that uh, the Pika mentioned before, trying to understand for, from player insights why these people left the game. And from that perspective, in most of the cases, the best way to re-engage them is through product changes, product updates, and trying to leverage some of the things that you have done in game to make sure that the potential players or the potential audience you are re-engaging understand that the game the pro is not longer what it it used to be is a good good promise for them to come back also what the pika mentioned regarding considering uh when these people uh, left the the, the, the product the, the game the app it's really important because the tactics may be different uh i think that uh, for people that have been between 15 days and 30 days they are still people that you can uh, try to re-engage um quite heavily for people that are you know uh, labs for more than one month is more is more let's say uh, challenging to bring them back but as mentioned in most of the cases uh, our campaigns that have been running uh, more powerfully have been focused on product improvements product changes rather than gifting or any particular let's say kind of uh, promotion that we are running I think from my side is uh, maybe I'll talk about the budgets wise. Um, in terms of your re engagement or re marketing, I think your budget will actually increase according to the age of your product. 
if I say this product has been around for a while, I think you would want to have uh, a bit more budget on reengagement or retargeting because a new product maybe you will go lesser and more focus on user acquisition. All right, uh, I think David previously, you know, had already touched upon this topic, but, um, and I think it's, it's worth discussing a little bit more uh, about, you know, product and marketing having, you know, the same message. Uh, how can we make sure that, you know, the marketing and the product have the same voice, the, you know, the experience is consistent and you actually keep the brand's promise or, or the message? What are the tips and you know you know something you can we can suggest to the audience about this well maybe picking up on that uh, i feel that first of all they need to feel part of the same team and the team is servicing the audience that you know the players or, or the user for that given product so that said i feel that uh in our case is a constant communication we have embedded marketing people in our game teams where they can uh, be updated of the latest things that we are building on and the last uh, things that uh, we are working on to make sure that they can leverage that content on you know different channels, not just from user acquisition perspective, but also in our community. And uh, that meant around having a closed loop of communication between marketing and product to make sure that anything that we know is going to be you know really exciting for players based on you know data that we've got from early insights, they can actually leverage in their campaigns. So. I presume it's a closed loop of communication between both teams. I think for both teams, um, there's a basic takeaway that these two teams need to understand between each other. So the marketing team is market your product to the product to the product team is make a product that can be marketed. So if both of them understand this rationale, right, then they, they will do something that is more cohesive. Yeah. So the thing to avoid is uh, the product and marketing team shouldn't be in silo. They will, they should always talk, like what David mentioned. They must always feel as part of a team. And then both of them, in terms of their mindset, must be interlinked. Yeah. So the product side makes things that can be marketed. The marketing team always remember that they are pushing their product. Yeah, in that context, and I'm trying to reach what uh, Ronnie mentioned before, uh, one of the critical things I mentioned uh, in the past uh, comments was around trying to make sure that creative optimization is fulfilling somehow the product um, specifications and that is really uh, delivering on our product promise. And in that example, we have a kind of game loop or product loop uh, where when we have a new testing in place, we are going through the different creatives through the, with the marketing team to understand what we feel is consistent to our play experience in game and what we feel is maybe too, um, too extreme and trying to make sure that, as mentioned before, once we have the players or the user in your product, they recognize the product itself and that they don't feel that they have been cheated or that, you know, through the user acquisition channel. Yeah, I would like to echo what both Ronnie and David said. Usually marketers are also avid users of the platform. So I think the product uh, team should use their knowledge because because they've been marketing it. So they use it and they, they, all, they also interact with users probably uh, in a different way. So I think that helps. And both marketing and product should speak the same language. So if you're promising something um, in your campaigns, it, it should actually translate into your product as well and it should all smoothly flow through versus like you have you use different language and copy or even assets in your campaigns and your product doesn't look anything like that and uh, uh, one interesting approach some of the silicon valley companies have been taking here is to have growth teams so the growth teams are they are hybrid teams which which have both product and marketing functions in them and they primarily try and focus on growth which is acquisition retention i think that could also be like something that uh, companies can look at exploring more okay so when it comes to product development perspective you know what should we keep in mind when it comes to the user acquisition journey uh, itself uh, so the product should keep in mind that when it's designing a product, it's for all kinds of users. So the new users, so the user acquisition brings in 
really new users. So then onboarding becomes very important. So, so if your product's um, not easy to understand and there are a lot of complicated things, I think you need to simplify it, or take the user through a journey in, during onboarding to get them familiarized and activate. So activation is like essentially the first time someone uh, performs an action that solves their problem or their need with that product. So, so they come to a product to uh, uh, watch something. So activation is if they've successfully watched a one episode or one video or, and, and then so they fully understand it. So they are activated and now you can use that to further retain them. So taking new users through onboarding and activation, I think it's very important and you cannot treat them as same as uh, returning re-engaged users. Yeah, so yeah, so, feeling in that context. Oh, sorry, Ronnie, please yeah. go ahead. With they you can go ahead first. Sure. Wow. Yeah, you can go ahead first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, oh. What I was going to mention is like uh, the pick, uh, pick it up as well. Uh, I think that is different to propose uh, uh, creatives or, or trying to understand how product can impact a new users from existing users. And uh, when you are looking into user acquisition, I think most of user acquisition campaigns look more generic and maybe less uh, deep in terms of actual uh, product features or product set that you are showcasing and focusing really on the uh, uh, KSP of the specific product. Uh, when you focus on, on, on reactivation is where maybe there are more meaty campaigns that uh, are more targeted and that you can propose different user journeys from that campaigns delivering different product opportunities that you may have there. So trying to think about how you can expand that opportunities for uh, re-engagement is really important. And people that are familiar to your app, to your game, is also as well really relevant because you can target them through different um, uh, product propositions. If it's a new user and maybe your game or your app is not well known, that's more challenging because you actually need to explain what it is about before actually proposing more advanced features. But I presume thinking on how this could affect product teams, I understand that try to make sure that you are exposing uh, your most uh, powerful uh, capabilities in the onboarding stage where you know people are just learning the product but can be exposed to things that can uh, sort out some of the challenges and fulfill their needs. And uh, as the Pika mentioned before, trying to activate these from the very first session, making sure that they feel that your product, your app, your game is really useful and fulfilling player or user needs. Yeah. So I think based on what David and the Pika has mentioned just now in terms of activation from the product, how marketing can utilize it or even match to actually reach out to consumers, that's fully agreeable. But I think there's another part uh, that uh, needs to be addressed is also um, there, are, there, there should be product features being made also to re-engage the users when you do retargeting. So I think the easy takeaway is that whenever a product feature is made, it has to be made that can be used by marketing as an advantage when you address, when you reach the user. Just like when Deepika was mentioning the onboarding. So it has to be made in a way that onboarding feels good, feels easy. And then when we come to re-engage the users, we must have a feature to let the players feel that, oh, it's worth coming back. So marketing will act on what's worth coming back and amplify it when, when they distribute in their channels. All right. I'll, <clears throat> I'll try to now ask a couple of audience questions as we have you know, six minutes left until the end of our session. Uh, we have a question from Elizabeth, uh, and she asks, it's commonly debatable between user volume and user's quality on acquisition. What do you think is better to focus on when retention comes into your KPI, but you still need to leverage new user space? Uh, this all depends on at what stage is your company in. So if it's a very early stage, then you're mostly focusing on acquisition. Right. So you need to build a solid user base before you can start focusing on retention. So so your KPIs reflect that. So your KPIs reflect what is your company's objective at any given stage. So if your com company's objective is more around monetization, 
um, then retention and monetization become important. Uh, and over time, retention becomes more important than acquisition because if you are fairly well known, um, users keep coming in. But if you don't have a good retention uh, mechanism, they will fall through. So and, and, and you wouldn't want that. And retention also can lead to referral and it retention leads to monetization. So so it all depends on the stage. But I think uh, if your company is uh, fairly old, then I think retention starts uh, becoming more important. Actually, my take of that question is that um, it depends on your stakeholders' priorities and also the type of product that you have. If you have a product that is generally very easy to use, straightforward, it's not complex, you can go for more user base because you know that people will come in and they will actually use it very easily. So your retention is sort of a lower pressure. If your product is a bit more complex, you have to be careful because a user that is not so interested to you know play around with your digital product, they will fall off. So that, that's where you have a, a case where you need to have better quality users so that they will finish learning how to use your product. And also uh, your stakeholder also plays a part. If the organization needs you know, revenue, so I think you have to go for a bit more quality users so that they will spend. And let's say the stakeholder, for some reason, they, they needed the user base for certain purpose, then again, yes. And this will be where you go for mass user to come in. So there are two factors from my view that you need to balance. Yeah, I echo what uh, both uh, Ronnie and Epica mentioned. Uh, I presume that it might be the critical factor is understanding uh, in which stage uh, your product uh, or, or app is. Uh, if you are just launching it, I think the kind of volume might be more important at this stage, trying to make sure that you are also you know, uh, picking on the brand component of the active, uh, active campaigns that you run. But also if uh, you think about how you need to expand your user base from zero, I think the only way to do that and trying to understand and getting KPIs and start to get in data to actually plan future ahead, you should focus on, on volume, um, considering that you can keep at least a certain, certain uh, profitability in this campaign that you're running. Uh, that said, if you are focusing on more mature product, I think that uh, in that context, I will focus more on quality and then I would not uh, stress that much at the volume unless you are really uh, churning a lot of um, uh, users from your actual product. But um, as uh, Deepika mentioned as well, it depends on the life cycle of, of your product or app. All right, I think we have time for one last question. And this question is about the, this question is about, you know, scaling. So when it comes to, you know, scale, uh, what is, uh, the usual split of users acquired from various channels? Uh, paid marketing, content marketing, app store optimization, referral. I, I understand it's, you know, we can take it case by case, but maybe each of you can talk about your your own, you know, use case. Uh, how do you approach that? Uh, it, it very much depends, the, it depends on the kind of product that you have. So, so for some uh, products, content marketing may not really apply. So, so if your product is creating content, right, and if it's either user-generated content or your own content, then then it bec be becomes a vital part, and it's like word of mouth and things like that. Otherwise, it would be like a combination of paid app store um, and referral. Again, is very product dependent. Not all products would scale well with referral. Um, so, primarily, like short answer is it depends on the product. Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, I feel here that uh, in our case, we have a big, uh, big pool of organics in our in our content. So for us, App Store optimization is really important and is really critical to the success of user acquisition, generally speaking. Uh, that said, I feel as well in our case, you know, referral and community is important, particularly because we have a big volume base on, on our player base. And then paid and content is relevant, but not maybe at the same scale as the rest. I think for my side, it's more uh, the balance between content and app store optimization.